Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. So nice to see you all. Um, I'm Carol Sinek Schmidt, and I uh, am part of the Historical Commission. I've been trying to get speakers on Duffy's Cut for a few years, actually. And we finally made contact, and, and I have Frank and Bill Watson um, from uh, Duffy's Cut Project. Uh, if you're not familiar with the project, it's where 57 Irish men and women died in August of 1832 and were buried in a mass grave. But I'll let them tell you all about that. Um, that, um, that, and also I'm excited that they've done, they're working on some other things in um, Downingtown at the Norwood Cemetery, so they'll tell us more about that. So this is Frank and Bill Watson. Thank you. Thank you for being here on the day when the Eagles are playing. Um, and so this is, this is uh, very much appreciated. We're going to start with a little video clip. Uh, Bill and I, um, you know, we, we're going to learn a little bit about this. It started really from our grandfather, Joseph Trippesen, who told us the story uh, when we were kids. Um, and we took it in 2002, starting in 2002, um, really as a family um, investigation, you know, turning, turning our grandfather's story, um, you know, into uh, what became... Uh, you know, a, a world, um, kind of a story that, that, that captivated the attention of some folks around the world, especially Ireland, um, as well as here in Pennsylvania and around the country. But we're going to give you a little bit of introduction here with a little video clip first, and um, that'll kind of speak this, for itself. This away actually, in a Philadelphia suburb, touched, a place uh, time has forgotten. You're looking at uh, a stream that is pretty much as it was in the 1830s. The Brothers Bill and Frank Watson lead us to the site where they are finding bones and skulls, remains of Irish railroad workers. 57 of these immigrants supposedly died of cholera at what's called Duffy's Cut back in 1832. But the Watsons and their team are digging here, convinced something more sinister was at play, a mass murder, and they're unearthing evidence of past violence. So it's like a CSI case. Absolutely, Absolutely. it was CSI. This is a murder mystery from 178 years ago, and it's finally coming to the light of day. The intrigue harkens back to their childhood, when these twin brothers would listen to their grandfather tell ghost stories about Duffy's cut. He worked for the Pennsylvania Railroad. But their smoking gun? A railroad file their grandfather left behind, stating that information about the 1832 deaths be kept confidential. It was enough to prod the Watsons, both historians, to investigate. But they looked for years without finding anything. The site is close to train tracks, covering a broad area. We have a, a general guide to work with in the old Pennsylvania Railroad file on this event. But what we needed really was the science, the hard science. Enter geophysicist Tim Bechtel. He used electric currents to map the area. This diagram shows where he picked up spots believed to be air pockets in the soil linked to decay of remains. It really is useful anytime anybody would like to know what's under the ground without digging or drilling. It's not as good as Superman's x-ray vision, but it has the same uses. And it led the Watsons to what they are looking for now. And this summer in um, 2010, we have made two more discoveries. So far, bones of seven people have been recovered, including four skulls all now in the hands of Janet Monge, a physical anthropologist at the University of Pennsylvania's museum. If you look at a lot of musket shots on skulls, they're not that little ping that you can see, you know, basically from a modern uh, firearm. Besides what she believes may be bullet wounds, she's also found evidence of violence in other skulls. So certainly if they had cholera, it didn't kill them. One theory that the new immigrants were murdered out of fear they would spread cholera. These researchers are determined to find the mass grave they say will shed light on what they call an historical injustice. Mary Snow, CNN, Malvern, Pennsylvania. We usually show that as just kind of a, a, a brief little 
presentation on the contours of the story. It's a local story here, of course, in Chester County. My brother Bill teaches. Uh, he's a professor of history at Immaculata. We played um, high school um, hockey out in this area as kids, so this area is kind of was our backyard almost when we were teenagers. And uh, this story um, really starts for us with the story of of the railroad. Um, our grandfather, that photograph of us walking along the tracks. Our grandfather did walk us along the tracks and told us stories. what happens, right? <laughs> so so the, the key is this, this image here on the upper left, this is an image from our grandfather um, among his railroad papers. Um, he, uh, this, is, this is the type of train that would have traveled along uh, the, the rail line out here in 1832. They had locomotives, but locomotives uh, took a long time uh, to run. They had to keep uh, cutting down wood to make sure that there was steam to power the engine. So horses were the most common form of conveyance on trains in the early years of the railroad. But you see here, this is the Philadelphia and Columbia Railroad. Uh, that was the earliest railroad um, in Pennsylvania at the time. It was a link between Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. And so we had um, this, this, you know, we actually found at the site of Duffy's Cut, some items associated with the earliest development of railroad in this country, including two sam examples of the earliest type of railroad track used in North America. So it's a site of historic value at a number of levels, most especially uh, because Duffy's Cut is a site of the death of uh, 57 Irish railroad workers. Um, this is a view of the track, the modern tracks. Um, and the thing is, originally the tracks were lower. Um, the tracks that the Philadelphia and Columbia built were lower. But what happened was they built an earthen railroad bridge. There was no money in the state budget to build a bridge here, so they had to come up with something creative to span a, a, a big chasm, as it was described, a valley. And they came up with an earthen railroad bridge called a fill. And the site was uh, the site of where the tracks were laid was called Duffy's Fill. Duffy's Cut was the cutting out of the earth over on, it would be to the, if you see this, this middle image, it would be to the, to the right of that image, or east. Uh, everything was cut out to make the flat earthen railroad bridge. Um, this is a scene from the other side of the tracks. Um, it's used by Amtrak today. It's used by, um, uh, by, by SEPTA. And you, know, you actually have people going by this site, hundreds of them, uh, at least a day. And we ended up searching in the archives in many different uh, places, in the Philadelphia City archives, um, in the, um, the county archives here in Chester County, the Historical Society archives. Um, we ended up going to Harrisburg, um, and we found um, a whole slew of things, including a contemporary report on Duffy's Cut. This is called the Mitchell Letter. It was written by Philip Duffy's supervisor. Philip Duffy was the contractor born in Ireland in 1783, came to America, um, uh, and was in 1798, the year of the Wolf Tone Rebellion in Ireland. Duffy left Ireland at a time of unrest, came to America, and um, was naturalized uh, during the War of 1812. Um, and this is the letter, the official railroad report from 1833 on his work. and. Um, it admits that there was a number as high as 60 men who died there. There it is. There's a, there's a, there's a, a full positive image of it for you. And it talks about the amount of money that was being spent. Duffy believed that um, he should have been compensated more, but his work crew died, and um, he was able to pocket that money. So uh, they denied him the uh, the claim for more compensation. It was in the newspapers that, uh, in what was called the cholera intelligence, that, that Irish railroad workers died building Duffy's Cut, but the number was downplayed in the popular press. And that really, that got us focused early on, because why would they, why would they try to downplay this, the real nature of what happened when they admitted internally a number as high as 60 men died there? Why would they deny the, the facts to the press? Well, it was finances and it was politics. Because the state, um, the, the, the government in Harrisburg was concerned about um, 
the, their expenditures, if people were scared there was cholera on the railroad, that an entire work crew um, would have died. There was concern that there would be lack of interest, people wouldn't ride the rails, um, and uh, you know, would have been a financial, could have been a very big financial disaster. We know for a fact that the railroad opened a year later than it was scheduled to because of what happened at Duffy's Cut. And that's a very important piece of this puzzle. There's one other thing uh, to note. I'm, I'm actually, this is a microphone as well. Um, at the bottom of this piece, it says that there was a, a cholera hospital opened by the railroad at Duffy's Cut, and that the charge of this hospital was um, committed to Dr. J.M. Pugh, who was at that time out in this area, um, very instrumental in uh, promoting the railroad here as well. And it's, it's going to be an important part of the story later on that you have an Irish contractor at mile uh, 59. The miles were measured um, west to east from Columbia on the Susquehanna. Um, and that's Philip Duffy. And then out here in this area, well, just, just to the east of here, at mile 48 in Downingtown, uh, Peter Connor, another contractor. And they faced similar circumstances uh, with the relations with the locals as um, part of the story of the newspaper piece from um, mile 60 uh, from 1829, which is just slightly to the east of Malvern, I said around Paoli, and it talks about problems between contractors and um, locals, uh, damage of property and so on. And so the sinister element here in this particular article, referring to Duffy's sturdy looking band of the Sons of Aaron and problems with the locals, um, you know, having some consequences. There's uh, reasons why we feel the same thing may have happened out here. Okay, there, there we go. There we go. All right. So um, this piece here is the first local story to talk about the deaths um, and, and the cholera in, in Chester County and in our vicinity of Duffy's Cut. And what's interesting is, is that it played down the number, again, of those who died. Um, and, um, but, but there is an interesting reflection here that one man um, moved up the Valley Creek uh, near the line of East Bradford and East Colm where he died. Um, and that is our first link with this part of the county. Um, and um, what we found in, in another history, a local history, we'll tell you a little bit more about that later, but the key is is that this links up with a 1909 source um, that talks about an Irish mass grave of railroaders locally here at Northwood Cemetery. So um, we know that, that at Duffy's Cut proper, um, there was an effort in the 1870s. Philip Duffy dies in 1871. We know that after he died, uh, because Duffy was a man of influence and power um, in the, in, among the railroading community, um, he was one of, probably the, one of the most successful contractors of his era. Um, he ended up um, becoming a contractor in the city of Philadelphia. Um, he contracted not just for the railroad, but was involved in the Aramingo Canal. If you've been on Aramingo Avenue, underneath there is a can what used to be a canal, a failed canal effort, but Duffy was on the board of that. Um, he was also um, one of the folks who was chosen uh, from the county of Philadelphia to elect a canal commissioner, um, a Democratic candidate for canal commissioner in the 1840s. He was a maker and a shaker, um, and it was only after his death um, and his, his grave is right about there in that cemetery at the St. Anne's up in Port Richmond. It was only after his death that people felt free to talk about what happened at Duffy's Cut. Because we know that in 1873, the railroaders, uh, the Irish American railroaders built that fence, that wooden fence, um, in the previous slide. If we can go up there. There it, uh, no. There it is. This fence was put up by railroaders, and this man, Patrick Doyle, was one of the ones who, he was really, the, he made a speech, um, and that's in our, our grandfather's railroad file. He made a speech on a holiday, and they raised a, a small amount from each of the men present, and they were able to erect the fence. This wouldn't have happened when Philip Duffy was alive, 
but after his death, they were free to talk about it, and that's a fact, and they built a memorial, um, and the railroad bore the expense of repairing that fence until, you want to flip to the next slide? No, not that one, the one with the, uh, there it is. Until this stone wall was built by Martin Clement, under Martin Clement, our grandfather's boss. Um, he was president of the Pennsylvania Railroad, and this replaced the wooden fence it's made out of the original railroad sleepers or sills, um, and the railroad um, allowed that to be built, but they did not allow a sign to go with it. Very strange. Yeah. Uh, oh, the, the um, where the stone wall is. Okay. Tremendous. Wow, that's great. Yeah, that's tr that's great to know. Okay, great. <laughs> that's thank you very much. What's what's neat is that the, that this area has been, you know, it was overgrown at different times and there are other groups that have helped to make sure that it's been preserved. The stone wall itself is um it's a fascinating thing. It looks like a little fort, like a little redoubt. Yeah. And uh, it's just a, it's a beautiful memorial. Recently, there was a sign put up there, that, that red sign um, that has been replaced. Um, and do you have an image of that one? And I'll turn this over to my brother because I've been monopolizing the time here. Um, there it is. This sign was put up um, through the efforts of the um, International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers from Amtrak. and. Um, we got permission from the, the uh, historical society in the township to be able to put this up. This is the first time that we had um, the fact that it's called Duffy's Cut on a sign and also the recognition that it was murder that took place there. At least we know that, that some of the bodies bore signs of murder that were clearly murdered. So from, from our perspective, the fact that we were able to re get that sign replaced and have an accurate presentation of the events is a writing of the story, a, a proper telling of the tale. Um, and, um, and, and as people ride by on Amtrak and the SEPTA trains are going to, you know, if the train's going slow enough, because there is a curve there, as you know, the Sugartown curve, people have told us that they've seen that sign. Um, you want to pick up? And ask any questions along the way. If you have any questions, certainly feel free to It's, it's the East Whiteland Horse Company, and um, yeah, we'll, we're definitely gonna, we're going to get to that because the likely suspects of whoever perpetrated the violence points to these guys, um, not only from the the uh, inferences we can draw from the sources, but from a phone call that came to my office in 2014 from someone who's in the Descendants Society. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, qu quarantine that went wrong, yeah. But, um, so how we got to, you know, to, to investigating this, um, the, um, the fact that the uh, railroad file that my brother referred to was preserved in our family, and um, that file was created by this man here, Martin W. Clement. Uh, eventually, he became the president of the Pennsylvania Railroad, um, a very influential uh, figure at the time that Franklin Roosevelt was in the White House and positioned himself, Clement, as a sort of a opponent to, uh, to Roosevelt. But um, a man who had a, a vast experience on his rise up uh, to become the president of the railroad within the railroad, not someone who was a businessman who then became the president of the railroad, but a railroader who back in 1909 when the stone monument was, was uh, erected, um, uh, was the guy who actually ordered the, the construction of that stone monument. Um, uh, having found uh, records uh, and um, oral histories among railroaders and had a concern that you know, he wanted to preserve the story. Again, the, the, uh, the stone monument that is visible from the tracks 
from the trains that pass by there, but also the, uh, the creation of the file. And um, Clement, um, at one point, though, decides that he doesn't want this out in the public. And in the file is a statement that it is not desired to let the file out of the office. That has to do with labor issues, uh, a feeling on the part of uh, the rank and file, you know, that they're being mistreated by the, uh, the, the bosses, uh, which obviously happened, and, um, but which uh, didn't uh, sit well in the, in the climate after the, uh, the beginning of the USSR, you know, and the Red Scare, and, you know, feeling that the, uh, the laboring man is being exploited by the, the bosses. This wasn't something that he necessarily wanted to continue to emphasize, but he still had an interest in keeping the story alive. And um, we have the, um, the record of when the Pennsylvania Railroad uh, merged with the New York Central and went under, and the various uh, sales. Uh, this is a Freeman's catalog of uh, miscellaneous bundles of documents. That file wasn't in there. There were a lot of other uh, railroad reports and other documents of various types that were historically significant that they thought they could get money for in an auction. But our grandfather, Joe Stripson here, was Martin Clement's executive assistant, retired as uh, eventually as director of personnel, the one and only director of personnel that the PRR ever had, and um, was able to take out of the vault those things that, which he thought were you know, interesting uh, from a historical perspective, the railroad let him do it, and he got that file. But if it weren't for that, uh, fact, this this file might have ended up in North Dakota or, you know, who knows where, you know, in some basement somewhere, and, it, and there will be a lot of details, really, that couldn't have been deduced without without the file as a starting point. Uh, so where's the luck of the draw? And the fact that, I mean, uh, Frank had the file and I got a job, you know, it's literally, uh, I don't know, three minutes? Al Dawson back here would know because he's the guy you'll see cutting down a tree that got uh, to uh, five... Uh, yeah, five skeletons. Um, so, I mean, it's close. It's like three minutes by car from our campus. And that's the luck of the draw kind of thing, too. Um, you want to, yeah, oh, so, so the, the acquisition of the marker that stands on King and Sugartown, this was the beginning of the whole thing for us. We, we got this in 04. Um, there was a lot, of, um, a lot of things that we learned along the way in getting that marker. Um, um, the importance of politics in the whole process because it's done by uh, s uh, state, congressional, and senatorial districts. And um, we eventually had to get a, a petition going, but we got the marker. Uh, state Senator John Rafferty had a lot to do with it. And also, uh, Senator, uh, future Senator Dinneman, at that time he was a Westchester councilman, but both of them were, were really influential in, in, in helping to push the, the marker through. Um, and um, that's the approval letter from the state. So getting this planted in the, in the history of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania was the first step um, along the way. And so we got it placed at the intersection of King and Sugartown with the help of the State Emerald Society and the Chester County Emerald Society, um, who are the Irish police officers of, uh, of Chester County. And uh, took a particular interest in this in, in literally sponsoring the manufacturing of the marker by the state. So. Um, and when the, um, the story for these guys begins is, of course, back in, in the spring of 1832, when they made the decision to cross the Atlantic. Um, Got to imagine Ireland at that time, a uh, few years before, um, you know, thanks to uh, the, 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 uh, the vote, um, things began slowly moving in, in the right direction, O'Connell and the vote, but it wasn't going to be for another 50 years that people in Ireland had economic parity with the Protestant ascendancy families and the, the group that had dominated the country um, you know, since, since the 1500s, since the time of Queen Elizabeth the I. Um, the, the, Norman, you know, the story, the, the, uh, the Norman conquest, uh, equally uh, exploitive of the English as of the Irish, um, but the Plantagenets you know, coming in in the, in the, in the 1200s and um, the, the uh, Anglo uh, Norman conquest, you know, of, of Ireland, resulting in a kind of colonial situation that doesn't really end until 1920. Um, and uh, in the view of uh, certain historians, you know, of uh, sympathetic to the Sinn Féin political position, it still exists to this day. But um, the, the ship that brought these guys over, uh, it was a bark called the John Stamp. We knew from the railroad file when these guys left and when they arrived, approximately. And that was an important thing to try to find names, to try to uh, take the story of Duffy's Cut out of the, the way that the Industrial Revolution is traditionally taught in textbooks 
as a bunch of charts and statistics, miles of rail line and things of that nature that don't humanize the real sacrifices that went into building an infrastructure like we've got in this country, which is, you know, um, again, used every single day. You know, thousands of riders every day go over what these men died to build. And now, because of the, the location in that file of a, of a, of a time frame, uh, when these guys arrived, then it was time to go down to the National Archives, and um, there really was only one ship between um, January and October of 1832 that had a predominantly laboring uh, group, um, and uh, that's the John Stam. And the luck of the draw with this is it arrives really precisely the moment when the file picks up uh, in June uh, of, of 1832. It sailed in April. Imagine you now you can go over in a couple hours. You know you're in another world but it took them from April to June. And um, we were able to locate the passenger list in the National Archives, and that's a lucky thing too, because you don't have a lot of the passenger lists still extant you know, from the early ships. It's a pretty lucky thing you know, in this case. We actually did uh, uh, have that survive by luck of the draw. It has names, county of origin, although not uh, town, that some of the issues with the town, we have, um, we have uh, references in our book to how you can find out the likely towns that some of these guys came from in the Griffiths evaluations, Griffiths valuations uh, from the time, and the age of the, the passengers and their occupation, it's the laborers we're looking at here. Uh, in Ireland, it, yes, they had the vote, thanks to O'Connell, but these, these individuals, for the most part, couldn't, couldn't even think about voting. Uh, they were busy surviving, uh, absentee landlords uh, controlling the economy. And uh, very little opportunity, except in the dockyards in um, Belfast, for a Catholic worker to actually earn a wage. Um, what's interesting, um, the, the, the social hierarchy of the docks was that the uh, Protestant workers were on top, Catholic workers on the, on the bottom building ships. We're going to find out, actually this was just last summer, that we've got the definitive proof who finished the, the cut, uh, the uh, brothers McCartney, uh, John and James McCartney, J and J McCartney, where Protestants from County Down ultimately finished the work at the cut. That was something that was found out after the, the book was, the most recent book was completed. But the social hierarchy at, at uh, Belfast and the dockyards was matched by the social hierarchy of what happened at the cut. None of, none of the McCartney brothers died, its employees died at Duffy's cut. It was Duffy's workers who died. It was the Catholics, not the Protestants. Um, this is the ad for the sailing of that ship, uh, which was, uh, you know, again, a kind of, uh, you know, moment of euphoria for us to be able to figure out the, uh, you know, precisely what those guys would have seen. The other part of the story, though, where the railroad was advertising, you know, is they would have, this is would have been the shining uh, beacon on the horizon, you know, in order to come over here to get, to earn a, a money uh, wage for the first time instead of, you know, a, a wage in, you know, uh, in kind. In fact, you want to take over a little bit and I'll come in again? That's the way we do our class, by the way, the one credit class that runs every now and then, which Carol took. <laughs> Moving along. So you're not, you don't have to listen to one of us too long, you know, we bore you, so. Um, what we found with Duffy is, um, in the 1830 census, he was living in this house with a number of, of laborers with him, a, lot of, a, lot, a number of alien, non-naturalized uh, folks, and, um, we also know from the local press accounts that he was working with this same group of Irish workers um, uh, for a bit before Duffy's cut. And so he has some roots in this area. Duffy ends up in Philadelphia where, um, where he died eventually, but he labored here all the way out into Lancaster County during his, his, his work as a contractor. Um, now some of the artifacts, it's, it's an interesting thing because we know that um, from the John Stamp ship list that they left the port of Derry, uh, which was then at, in that time in the 1830s, the biggest uh, port of embarkation um, in Ireland. Um, and Philadelphia was the largest uh, port of entry at the time. And so these folks were coming from a place where a good number of, of folks were leaving Ireland at this period for economic reasons. They came to a city of hope and, and of expectation, Philadelphia, and we believe that the laborers were hired shortly, you know, right after they came off of the ship. But we know for a fact that um, as, we, as we were excavating at, this, at the Duffy's Cut site, we found three fragments, one complete pipe bowl, fragment of another, and a pipe stem that connect um, the folks who were laboring in that valley with their homeland. And this was extremely, besides that, you know, the two pipe bowls with Irish nationalist symbols on them, this piece 
Um, where'd it go? Oh, here it is, yeah. This one here says flag of Ireland, complete pipe bowl. And, um, you know, there's an Ira there's a, one of the old round towers, Viking era round towers on the other side. But this is, this is a nationalist uh, symbol that would have been used in the Wolf Tone Rebellion in 1798. Um, there, and then the thing is, is that Derry as the port of, of departure for our folks, this was a highly significant day. We found those three fragments on the same afternoon. It was crazy. Um, and so we know from the, where they were living in the shanty uh, that we found several you know, very personal items. Pipes would be smoked among people. They'd break off a little piece of the stem and so on. But we found complete stems um, indicating, uh, and, and with, with burn marks on them, indicating that when, they, when the shanty was burned, and we have a record of that in the railroad file, um, that everything was left as it was, as it was intact when these men died there. Um, we know that they came largely, they were mostly from the area of the ancient Ulster, Donegal, Tyrone, and Derry being the three largest counties um, where our laborers came from. Um, and what's interesting, um, from when we were in the north, when we were in the north in 20, um, 2013 and 2015, um, we were able to, to bury one set of remains in Donegal and another in Tyrone. Um, and there was an incredible deal of support because folks in Ireland, uh, ha everybody had a story in their family of somebody coming to America and disappearing after they arrived. You know, whether they, they just didn't talk to their, they weren't able to write to them, um, but they knew they were coming here for a better life and they would send them off in what was called, um, uh, you know, it was basically considered a wake. You were still alive and you had a family wake sending you off to America. Fascinating. Okay, very cool. Excellent, excellent. Wow. Well, this is the thing. It was a common experience. You know, people, these folks left Ireland because there was nothing for them here and went there. And when they came here, they had, you know, they had the world before them, unless like these poor folks at Duffy's Cut, they died within, within six to eight weeks. So Duffy, we're back to Duffy, yeah. Duffy is buried at St. Anne's. We found his, his death record, his, his burial record, rather, uh, in the parish register. We had found him listed in the um, Philadelphia Death Index, and we, we do have his death certificate. Duffy was listed um, as a gentleman on his death certificate. He made a fortune, a real a great deal of money working at Duffy's Cut, but spent his, most of his career working on the railroad, and he ended up as a very rich man. Um, and uh, was able to be listed as a gentleman on his death certificate. Um, so um, let's see. We have um, this was this was this is from the Penn Gazette. Um, a very gra you know a, kind of a very artistic depiction of the railroad riding over a skull. And this is a, a, a picture from the uh, Philadelphia Magazine, um, and it shows the, the the trains going over skeletons and elements of work crew uh, gear. Um, this is uh, uh, on um, Maggie, um, Mar Marty McGee's, um, and it's, and, and they actually, he, the artist actually depicted Duffy's cut there. This is a close-up of it, and it's a very, very powerful thing, because this story has caught the imagination of folks. Um, there are, there's not, and I'm using this as a segue a little later. We have an, a, a musician here who's going to perform uh, for us a, a, new, a new Duffy's Cut song. Um, we actually were able to, to release a CD um, of some of the recordings of tunes. It has caught the popular imagination, the story of, of men and women coming to America for a better life and, and not making it, being on the wrong side of the American dream. Um, and the story being suppressed, and all of those things have played into, uh, uh, you know, into the telling of the tale. Um, you can see here, you know, various. This was this was from our first um, from our first work here. Ron LaBarker from U.S. Radar in New Jersey, not far from where I live. He came and um, did a survey. This is Walt Hunter, uh, C CBS News, um, and um, you'll see. I mean. The interesting thing is, is that Ron LaBarca and U.S. Radar um, have helped us more recently again. They were out there again doing a survey at Northwood. Tim Bechtel, you saw in that video clip, um, our GPR, um, G, you know, just an incredible 
um, scientist who has donated his time and his efforts to helping us solve the mystery. We would use these sifters. You know, we did actually um, un we did the dig under um, uh, Janet Monge from the University of Pennsylvania and and Samantha Cox. Um, Janet is a physical anthropologist, and Samantha Cox is a is a PhD um, archaeologist who got her doctorate at Cambridge. She knows her stuff too. Um, and so we, you know, we were taught how to do this, and they were with us for most of the most of the the, the work there at Duffy's Cut. Um, you know, we had site surveys. We actually, right before the pandemic, we met with with the state um, historical commission. There's a site survey that's being produced. Um, so all sorts of things have gone on even during the pandemic. But um, you know, we have our museum at Immaculata. You can go and see in the library there many of the artifacts that were recovered at the site. Again, including one of the two earliest pieces of uh, railroad track used in North America, the Morris and Essex track, and one of them is on display. The only other one is at the Smithsonian, and then there's another one in storage. But um, we found um, buttons, likely from suspenders, um, in the burned out remains of the shanty. These are um, pewter buttons that were found on uh, one of the, the remains. Um, no clothing uh, survived, of course, being buried in the ground for 180 years or so. But what we have is uh, uh, items like a shoe buckle, a pants, pants clasp, um, two of these buttons, these likely from a, a haversack of some sort on, on the man under the tree. And this is a Barlow knife. It's, like a, it's, a, it's a knife uh, that would come out of a handle, and that was found with those two buttons. So we think, we surmise, that the knife would have been a little little sack that was uh, clasped together with a couple of those buttons. This is the Greater Philadelphia Search and Rescue Crew, um, and they helped us to locate um, what was the shanty. Oh, there we go. Yes. Good question. Excellent question. We know that our Irish laborers lived in a shanty. They lived, they, I mean, Railroad workers, if they didn't live locally, the contractor would hire folks and put them in a shanty. And so in this case, there were about 60, up to 60 individuals living in the valley at Duffy's Cut in tents and lean-tos and things like this. And they would have their meals prepared there. They would live there. They'd work there. Um, and what we know from the railroad records is that after the last man died, that the blacksmith um, who worked for the for the contractor Philip Duffy was ordered to burn the shanty down, so we found um, through the Greater Philadelphia Search and Rescue folks um, a shanty. There were bur burned out remains of a shanty. It was like um, it was not almost a square, you know, an area that was um, covered over by soil, but underneath it, a couple inches was was an ash field, and in that ash field we found. You'll s I'm sorry for pointing this at you. I, I know you can. Anyway, th this this is this is a, a map that indicates where a number of different artifacts were found in that burned out field. We actually found an unused grave there as well, um, and inside it was the shape of a, of a person's body, you know, of a casket. Of, but uh, in there were actually remains of pipe stems and pipe bowls and things after it was it was burned down. Things were clearly raked into that hole. Um, yep. And okay, so here we have. This is um, the pants clasp that was found on the first man that we recovered, an 18-year-old young man. And this is a shoe buckle found on him. Uh, these are remains um, of his body. He was laid out with his head in the west and feet in the east in the classic Christian mode of burial. Um, and that that didn't hit us until I think maybe the second or the third body that we recovered. We realized. These people were buried in caskets, and they were actually oriented as they would have been if there was a proper burial. Even though the, the, they, were, they were buried at the base of a railroad fill, the hillside that the railroad track sat on, they were buried at the base of that. That became common practice um, uh, among railroaders who had buried under the tracks you were making. This is the first documented case where that happened in North America. Very important. So, but what happened was this story was covered up from the beginning. So we know they were buried not simply as a sign of respect. They were probably put in the earth by their fellow laborers um, uh, because there is a sign of respect among the first seven burials there. But um, what we found, 
you know, we'd be excavating and we'd find, like, here's, here's this is the woman that was recovered. Um, and this is, this is the, we call him the tall man because he was over six feet. Um, and again, they were all oriented as you would if it was a regular, you know, proper burial. Our work crew, um, this is Janet Monge in the middle here, physical anthropologist. Um, Tim Bechtel is in the red, and, and right next to him is Samantha Cox, who is our project archaeologist. Tim Bechtel produced things like this, electrical resistivity, and that was John Ruddy's grave. Um, he gave us this mark, and he says, dig here. <laughs> so it was really, it was amazing. So, um, and this shows you, this photograph shows you, um, this, is, this, is, this is the hillside, and right about here would have been the tracks. Um, and this was where the first body was recovered, right there. So we've, we had a great deal of, of um, interest in Ireland, as we said earlier. Um, this is the president of Ireland, um, Michael Higgins. And um, he, he heard of Duffy's Cut before we met him, but it was nice to be able to talk to him personally and just kind of, uh, you know, uh, Thank, thank him on behalf of the Duffy Scott Project. That includes Al Dawson over there for all of the work. You know, they, they actually, um, you know, had a lot of coverage. They also produced two television documentaries that were shown here in America over in Ireland. Um, when we were at, over in 2015, we had a chance to, to meet um, with Pat Doherty, who had been the vice president of Sinn Féin. We met him at the Derry Guild Hall. Um, and this is um, Linda Dillon, who was the Lord Mayor of, of Mid-Ulster. <laughs> she was the mayor of Mid-Ulster, another Sinn Féin politician, very supportive of the project. Um, we have here, did you want to get into this? Yeah. How about you do this? Because this is, uh, th th these are very significant. So th this is um, uh, the uh, remains of John Ruddy, the first uh, individual we found. Well, we were able to figure out his name because Janet Mon said it was an 18-year-old male. How we got there, by the way, with the, with the radar, the GPR that Tim Bechtel did, um, he'd found skeletons from other sites as far back as the French and Indian War working for the state in various capacities. And he came to us through the University of Pennsylvania um, through a guy named Drew McGee. Who, uh, who we knew uh, through our bagpiping associates, who was a, a chemical engineer down there. And we said, well, we need, we need radar. We're not going to be able to find these skeletons by means of uh, you know, metal detectors. And so um, Tim did a survey in um, uh, December of uh, 2008. And we got the images in March of 2009. And it was the week, it was the Friday after St. Patrick's Day. It was the week of St. Patrick's Day that we found the first uh, set of remains. Oops. And um, so that yeah, that little image right there is what Tim found. And the and the uh, the, uh, the the skeletons on the the uh, stuff on the table there was the uh, the 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 uh, things that were found from that specific spot. And yeah, it did include a uh, pants clasp. It did include a uh, shoe buckle. Uh, shoe buckles down at the Penn Museum, and the pants clasp is in our museum. Um, we, you know, the University of Pennsylvania also has uh, several of the teeth for the potential use for DNA extraction. You got to get DNA from old skeletons from teeth, and um, so this 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 particular image here. This is uh, the forensic dentist who joined our team, Matt Patterson. He'd worked with the Navy uh, identifying GI remains on the basis of teeth, and um, he he pointed out something really interesting that this first skeleton that we found, the approximately 18-year-old individual who has to be John Ruddy, buried in a fill that didn't predate 1832, it was only completed in 1832-33, and nobody was buried there afterwards. The timing of this is important. It became an active rail line thereafter. So this had to be John Ruddy, 18 years old, on the ship list, coming from Donegal, with a very rare dental anomaly. He did not have his right top front molar from birth. It's called an M1A genesis. Uh, which is fairly rare, um, but once this story hit Ireland, as Frank said, that the uh, 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 interest in Ireland uh, for the story from the governmental level on down from the very beginning was very, very high. And um, Ruddy's from Donegal, who were also missing their right top front molar from birth, contacted us uh, very shortly. There's a huge cluster of these individuals with the M1A genesis in Donegal, where Ruddy is reported in the uh, 
uh, the uh, ship list having come from. Um, other uh, things of, of interest here were the injuries on the tall man, uh, SK-005. The skeletons were identified by number SK-001 through 7, the ones we've excavated. This is 6, yes. And um, so this guy uh, uh, had a, a bullet hole on the top of his head that was identified uh, by Janet Monge uh, having lead swipe. Uh, there's lead uh, on, on the skull and on the interior of the cranium. And that is what uh, the x-ray over here shows. These were done at, down at, the, at HUP at the uh, University of Pennsylvania Hospital because the, uh, uh, the use of x-ray here um, is not something that the museum staff had access to. But Hupp was very willing to, to allow it. And this is a CAT scan. Um, this man, according to Janet, um, and, and there are 10,000 uh, sets of remains at the Penn Museum. You know, This is something that is like a, a city of the dead. Um, but a, a physical anthropologist is trained very much like an MD. Um, and you know, perimortem violence, time of death violence, ha leaves a, a, a distinctive feature for a physical anthropologist as compared to a premortem uh, wound or a postmortem injury or damage caused by roots, for example, uh, going through a set of uh, skeletal, skeletal remains. So she says these were perimortem, time of death uh, examples of violence. The axe blow uh, came first. Uh, this guy was over six feet tall, so we presume that took him to his knees, and the bullet was fired very close range, right over the top of his cranium, which doesn't happen in most cases uh, you know, when people die of cholera. So um, the railroad reporting of this story that it was a, uh, uh, a mass cholera uh, uh, circumstance um, had to be modified. And you know, we'd had our suspicions because the, the statistics in cholera outbreaks is usually about 50% uh, casualties. Uh, the railroad itself reported when they had every reason to try to modify that, that it was 100% of the workers in the valley. So all 57 of those guys. Not the workers up top and the McCartney crew, but the, the Duffy crew down in the valley were the ones who, who all died. And so we, we began to get evidence in these skeletons from the very first one on forward of violence. Ah, now here we are. The problem in a typical archaeological excavation, um, well, <clears throat> you don't usually have trees growing through uh, sites. And this, this site had a, a, a tree that our friend in the back here, Al Dawson, uh, helped us take care of. Uh, we had gotten um, uh, some grant money uh, very rarely. We, we were denied for every grant we ever applied for until 2014. But thanks to Andrew Dinneman, we got a grant. And that included some tree removal. But the tree removal left <laughs> uh, all of that. And um, these are two of my dig, my students, dig crew guys, Taylor and uh, Charles. And um, you can see how big that is. That's Al, Al Dawson, right in the back of the room here, who has family uh, members at Northwood. So he's going to be connected with us in that as well. Um, came out one day and did a miracle and cut this, this, yeah, put that up. This is an amazing uh, uh, stroke of light. Good idea. And, and so what, what Al's going to do is take this down so that we can then find what's underneath. We, I called, you, you know, you, you have to learn a lot of things. With this. I'm a historian by training, obviously. But you've got to learn archaeology. You've got to learn as, as, as much as you can of these various ancillary things. And it included calling Longwood Gardens and finding out, is it safe to tunnel under the remains of a tree? What would you say, Al? Was that about 50 feet? Yeah, it was, it was massive. And that thing came down. And once that came down, we could excavate what was beneath. Uh, that's important, is that Tim Bechtel's first uh, reading found John Ruddy. His second reading found four skeletons, right, four, five, six, yeah, four skeletons under that tree. They had um, since, uh, you know, lost their flesh and everything, but they, the nutrients that were left there allowed for that tree to get to be so huge. And, yeah. and it made a loud thump, but without Al, we never would have gotten there. And so uh, we, we were on a timeline, too, with the homeowners. This was not a typical archaeological site in that regard as well. We had to make a, uh, arrangements with the homeowners. Immaculata paid the insurance for the dig crew. The homeowners granted us a certain time period. They said, by the end of the summer, we got to get out of there. And um, now this is the summer of 20, 
2010. And, but thanks to Al, right in the end of August, we got skeletal remains from under the tree, and we got permission to go through the spring of 2012. And that's going to be critical. Um, the, the other guy over here is kind of important. Joe DeVoy, he's out in Lancaster, runs Telus 360 in another wedding venue. But he's an Irish immigrant. I think he's from Cork. Uh, perhaps um, came over here 30 years ago and um, is an individual who has a sense of history. As an immigrant himself, wanted to help us out. And he, he is a, he's not only a, a wedding venue uh, uh, entrepreneur, but he's a contractor and had a lot of heavy equipment. And he said he wanted to get the tree that Al cut down removed to make musical instruments out of it and um, call it 57 brand. And uh, you know, music being so important to the Irish psyche, this would have been something you know that we, we immediately we said yes, absolutely. But most importantly, um, you know, pulling the stump out, which I mean, my God, how do you pull a stump of something that's 100? It was originally 120 feet tall. So there it is. I have a video of that, but that's not here. Um, of 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 Joe Devoy popping that stump out, but that was like a tooth being popped out. Below it were human remains, and um, here he is sitting on the uh, the wood. But um, there's a lot of things, you know, that, that just a serendipity kind of scenario here. Even the connections with, um, you know, these, these outside experts in the science area who came in. Uh, first was Tim Bechtel via um, Drew McGee from the, the, the University of Pennsylvania campus where I went to grad school, and that's how we got these guys in. But Tim's first cousin is Matt Patterson. Um, Tim got him on board. Tim also got Janet Monge on board working with her at the Penn Museum. And then uh, they all knew... Uh, Tim and Matt and Joe DeVoy are all in Lancaster. They all knew each other. Small world kind of stuff, but really fortunate for us. Um, so the final product of this, we wanted, we wanted to excavate and we wanted to find the human remains and we wanted to bury them properly because all the indications were in 1832 that they were buried improperly, except for the first seven who were buried in coffins with, by the way, about 100 nails used to seal those coffins to conceal the bloody mess inside. Um, the others would have been, you know, just dumped in a, in a kind of uh, mass grave scenario like we might be familiar with in the Civil War or other wars of, 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 of the past. But this is an industrial site and not a war zone. But uh, the other part of the thing was, you know, examine them. Janet Monch did uh, lots of measurements and indications of, you know, what their physical health would have been. Wrote up reports. She and Samantha Cox did that. Matt Patterson did his due, his, uh, due part with the, uh, the forensic dentistry. And um, then the other part of this was not a typical archaeological project. We wanted to rebury them. We wanted to get these guys the proper respect that they were due because they were thrown in the equivalent of an 1832 trash heap. We felt that was, uh, from the very beginning, uh, something that made this different from a typical academic project. How do we get a cemetery on board? And this was West Laurel Hill. Uh, my God, to thank God for uh, Walt Mail, late uh, employee there. He just died this year. We owe him a hell of a lot because he got us in the door here and the uh, uh, administration uh, very greatly backed us uh, in our plans. Yeah, and uh, that's what you shrink down to after 180 years. The cross was taken care of by Immaculata. Uh, we had a, a fundraiser, but it wasn't enough, and Tom Ford, the uh, previous uh, VP of Finance, Sign the check. I, I don't think the president was necessarily yeah, even aware of it. Thank God he did it, though, because it happened only because of the fact that, that he signed that check. It was a $16,000 cross. Yeah, so Brenda Monge from Glen Isle, 50 years. Uh, my father, Leroy Hill, from Glen Isle, 50 years. Provinces. And we had an auxiliary bishop out. Our pipe band played there. A lot of people were there, Al. It was just a, a great day for, for, you know, that's what we wanted to do. We, we, if it had been our own kids, we would have wanted that, or ourselves. We, if, but for time and circumstance, it could have been anyone in this room. Yep. Open to the public, as long as the cemetery hours, you know. I mean, it's it's... Yeah, we, we do an annual memorial there uh, every year, and uh, it really is, uh, you know, free and open to the public. Um, as far as the sites related to Duffy's Cut, the museum located in the Gabriel Library at Immaculata University, 
the cross at West Laurel Hill, and um, the historical marker on King and Sugartown. Those are local. If you're in Ireland, um, there is a, uh, a stone for John Ruddy. Um, I don't know if that's the next one. No, John Ruddy's stone right here. Sorry, Frank, I had the ones with the, when he, did, I loaded my PowerPoint, and whenever he does it, it's him in the, in the Ruddies, and when I do it, it's me in the Ruddies. But these people all donated their DNA, and Vince Gallagher donated the grave. He's the guy who founded the Commodore Barry Club, the Irish Center, Northeast Philly. Gave us his family plot, and was buried here by uh, Canon um, Austin Laverty, and the, the funeral director was uh, with the curious name of Shovelin. He did a very good job. Um, there we are leading the, the crowd in, and there's John Ruddy's stone. Do you want to do the uh, the video, and then and then here I'll do that for you up here. So we we actually um, have a video uh, showing this uh, burial in in uh, in uh, County Donegal. Uh, it's from RTE. Um, that's the national television in, in Ireland. And so you can... Let's go help people customize and save with Liberty Mutual. Okay, who sat at my desk? We're, we don't... We don't... We, yes, we're, we're not... Not with... Far from the hills of Donegal, John Ruddy was killed and buried in a mass grave at the age of 18. He was among a group of workers from Derry, Tyrone and Donegal who found employment on a railroad near Philadelphia. The men had been in America for only six weeks when cholera broke out. It is believed that the 57 men were murdered by fellow railroad workers who feared that the Irish men were spreading disease. Vincent Gallagher uh, thought it would be appropriate that John Ruddy should be reinterred in his own county and he offered his grave here beside the chapel behind me. It's an interesting day and a bit, ex a bit exciting as well and a bit unusual. I suppose he's going to be the oldest man ever buried in our draw at 198. Today, the research team from Immaculata University accompanied his remains to Ardara, where a grave had been provided. A crowd had gathered to pay their respects to a young man killed 181 years ago. Well, hopefully we have 50 more of them to bring home by the end of the year if we can do it. So, you know, we're really looking forward to seeing if we can make sure that these guys get treated properly. We're hoping that we can shed some light on the incident at uh, Duffy's Cut. I mean, it's been, it's been in the dark for so many years, nobody's known anything about it. While John Ruddy's tale has come to an end, work is still ongoing in America to identify and repatriate the remains of those buried at Duffy's Cut. Enini Reshlan, RTE News, in Ardara and County Donegal. Yeah, it was, it was really kind of an amazing thing because we were declared to be the legal guardians of the remains that we had recovered at Duffy's Cut. My brother and Earl Shandlemeyer and I, we, we were declared the legal guardians of those remains. So we were asked to then lower his body into the ground. And it was, I think that was one of the most amazing experiences. Um, you know, we, we, I mean, what can I say? I mean, it was just, it was an unbelievable experience. And the folks up there, you know, in, in Donegal, um, um, remember this event you know they still talk about it. there are tours that go there to look at this look at this grave um, tours from America they, they end up there um, but anyway the uh, let's move to the next one so in 2015 um, the um, the last person that we had recovered at the site um, at least as as of now was um, SK007 we called her and that's Catherine Burns we had a, um, a a wake in the upper left. You'll see the, um, the image. Father, now he's Canon Fee, Canon of Ormont Cathedral, Canon Benny Fee. Um, the whole town of Clano turned out. It was beautiful. Um, and there was a f uh, then a funeral mass. This was her first memorial cross that was replaced more recently by a beautiful uh, hand carved uh, Celtic cross that stands over her grave. Um, and the whole town, the whole town, much of the county turned out, including the Lord Mayor of, of County um, of uh, Mid, Mid Ulster. So we have a video of that we're going to show you, which I think is t really tells it in better ways than my brother and I could. Yeah, so this guy um, who filmed this was getting a master's, and he was getting a master's in uh, folklore, and uh, so this was part of his project. Um, uh, they got us off the plane. I got to tell you that that 
that scene right there is a crime being committed because we didn't go through the red channel. And I had taken so many pills on that plane, I had no idea where I was. We get up to Belfast. I mean, we're on our way to Belfast, but halfway up. And I said, you guys, did we go through the red channel? Nope. <laughs> but we'd, we'd gone through the TSA over here. We just didn't over there. And we put a marker down at that point for Ruddy. It was replaced by the permanent one shortly thereafter. Um, the, um, what's that? Uh, Della Vecchia in, in uh, Westchester gave us a temporary one that was replaced by the permanent one that exists there now. Shovelin did the permanent one. seven dear people and in the history of the church there are six plus one corporal bodily works of mercy the first six come from the gospel of saint matthew chapter 25 the great last judgment story when jesus said that the king in the story identifies himself with the poorest of the poor. And he says, in so far as you did this to one of the least of my brothers and sisters, you did it to me. When I was hungry, you give me to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was a stranger, you made me welcome. When I was sick, you visited me. When I was in prison, you came to see me. That's the six. And for the first 300 years and more of the church, that was the six corporal works of mercy. But in the fourth century, the church, reflecting on an incident in the book of Tobit in the Old Testament, they added another a better number, the seventh corporal work of mercy, to bury the dead. And today, dear people, thanks to our American visitors, it is our privilege to practice the seventh corporal work of mercy to bury the dead. And that surely is an awesome privilege for all to own people today. For Catherine is one of our own. She's no stranger. She took the boat to the USA for no other reason than she had no choice. She could stay at home, starve, or she could gamble on taking the ship across the Atlantic and with a bit of luck, catch the tail of the American dream. But if she hoped to escape the purgatory of her life in Ireland, as Christy Moore's song, Duffy's Cut, says so well, she was sailing into hell. And less than two months after her arrival in the New World, she and her 56 Irish companions at Duffy's Cut were all dead and buried in an unmarked grave. And worse still, no one that mattered thought the 57 mattered. And like their bodies, the story of their death was covered up for almost 200 years. But, dear people, there's a goodness in the hearts of men and women and today, as a Tyrone man myself, and on behalf of all Tyrone men and women, I thank the people of Duffy's Cut Project for the courtesy and respect they have shown our Tyrone Catherine. 
Karamilama Agov, Agus Banak J. Orov, Galair. A thousand thanks and God's blessing on you all. And we praise God that you were kind enough and able enough to do it. Thank you so much indeed. idea that we're doing this <clears throat> on behalf of these individuals but we would we would we would hope that it might someday you know uh, others others you know would have the same courtesy shown to them um work that we've done subsequent uh locating with uh, gpr the mass grave under the stone monument core samples done in 2015 there are a lot of logistical issues in terms of getting back there and that's why we're out here at northwood <laughs> it's going to be a little easier uh at neh uh group of teachers came out, uh, high school teachers, to Immaculata in 2016 to put Duffy's Cut in the curriculum. So that was another part of this thing for us, to get it out there uh, into the general body of knowledge. And then it's, it's had an impact in a lot of ways, not only the art, you know, um, literature. And we, we've got a musician with us today, Gabriel Koya, and he might you know, start setting up here. He's going to sing you guys uh, the newest Duffy's Cut song. Um, we, once he's done, you know, if there's any questions about the Northwood dig that we're going to get back to next, next Friday, uh, week no, a week from uh, December 3rd, I think it is, we're, we'll be happy to answer. But without further ado, we'll give Gabriel the uh, the floor here.
Thank you so much, Gabriel. Uh, it's an honor to have have music written about this project, and it's just it's beautiful, beautiful piece. Thank you so much. Questions? Yes. Yes, um, with the with the John Stamp ship list, which was kind of our our overarching tool in this, um, you can actually see that. I think we have we have that um, in the book uh, in terms of the search for the names. We do have, um, you know, like the, the laborers that he was working with before Duffy's cut that continued working with him. We'll never know their names because they weren't listed in the 1830 census. It was it was the homeowner and the people living with that home, at least the, the, the person loci, you know, who, who filled out the census, um, you had their name, but you did not have anybody living with them. So whoever was the head of the household, that's who was listed. So we probably will never know some of, uh, you know, a good number of those names, but we have from the, from the, 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 the stone at, at, the ledger stone at um, West Laurel Hill has a number of the names that we were able to search for um, doing, uh, and in the book, yes. So we did a, a full genealogical search, the same type of research that we did for um, for finding Philip Duffy from birth to life. We did on the names uh, of the ship register of the laborers, and um, and most of them disappear from history, you know. And that's uh, so. That's as close as we're going to get because the, the railroad itself never kept an accurate record. The contractors sometimes did because they had to know who they paid. But most of those records have disappeared. Duffy's brother-in-law, James Smith, who was also from Ireland, when he died, uh, he died owing money to his laborers, and in in his uh, in his will, basically, they, that was probated, there was a list of all of his laborers. But that's the only case we found where there's a full listing of those laborers. Most of them, you know, when the when the contractor finished that mile, that record was burned. There was no re need to keep it. Good question, though. Yes. Yes, yes. In the back, yep. It's, it's, it's very close to Immaculata. It's a couple minutes away by car. But the crew that, who, you know, our, our student dig crew were all from, you know, students from Immaculata. And on the Immaculata insurance, big part of the negotiations with the homeowners was, do you have insurance? <laughs> you know, so the university very generously, you know, provided that. Yeah, it's a, it's a, I'm, I'm still there. I'm, I'm going to retire there. You know, it's, I got another 10 years ago because, you know, salaries are what they are. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this is interesting. So while we were working there, um, Joe Carroll, who was the uh, the DA for Chester County, had it declared a crime scene. The uh, the Chester County Emerald Society guys, you know, made sure that this was all, you know, done uh, properly. And they got the uh, county uh, coroner's office involved as well. And so um, we're going to be going through very similar uh, circumstances uh, at Northwood very shortly. And so it's Matt Gordon who is the chief down in Kennett, who's going to be the liaison for us with the um, the county coroner and the county DA now. But, um, yeah, it really, the, the, that's another side of the thing that we had to learn. You know, that w yeah, there's, there's, you can't just excavate anywhere willy-nilly as long as the human remains are involved. And, uh, you know, what procedures have to be undergone. Yeah, yeah, it, it is it is the case that the image, <clears throat> see if I can find the, uh, I've got to get to the to the, the radar image that Tim Bechtel got us that was at the end of that documentary, Death on the Railroad, the very last uh, uh, story <clears throat> documentary form. Um, the radar image that he got for us, let me just, where is that? Where's the image of the whole picture? It is a crescent, 
uh, it's it's more maybe more like there it is it's more like a J, the the um, the, the the disposition of the bodies. And this is the problem too with the uh, the core samples that were taken in 2015 were all on the um, the uh, uh, the north side of the stone monument and not on the south side because our geologist wasn't there. But it does go around here. The tracks are out here. It goes in a kind of arc. In a, in, a, in, a, in a shape of a J. So it starts about here and it goes all the way out to the track line. So there will be some individuals who will never get excavated. We do hope to go back there, but I don't, I don't, you're not going to be able to go under the tracks. Right, exactly. Yep. Yeah, it, 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 and, and it's proximity to the tracks, you know, that, so that the, 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 the site. For years, we labored under this illusion that was actually um, manufactured by the homeowners, that they owned that property. It's not. None of that is owned by the property owners. There's an easement right through the middle uh, down to this spot, and it is all Amtrak land. Now, Joe DeVoy came up with a plan that Amtrak approved, you know, for heavy excavating there, you know, you know, certain distance from the track. Certain people we will never be able to excavate if we do get back there because they're too, they're, they're under the, literally some of them are under the tracks. In, 20, in 2012, we ended up going to Washington, D.C. Um, Joe DeVoy um, actually got us an appointment with folks from the House Transportation Subcommittee down in, in, in the Capitol. And it was just, it was fascinating because um, Amtrak at first had said, you know, they were c concerned about the, the um, integrity of the tracks and the dig site. Well, Joe, De Joe DeVoy had such a precise um, pl site plan. Um, the folks in the House Transportation Committee uh, subcommittee thought uh, there's this this looks great. Amtrak called us what the next day, the next couple days. You can go ahead and do it. It's all good. So we have Amtrak approval to do this, to do that that phase, but we're not going to be able to go underneath the tracks. But um, oh yeah. We're technically contractors, but we're certainly not Philip Duffy. It's it's an, yeah we had to do the Amtrak safety exam so it says uh, not good for free rail travel but you're <laughs> but otherwise it was it was a, it was a, it's been an incredible process um, question so in Downingtown at Northwood Cemetery we had two we had two records um, we had that that 1832 newspaper piece that said that one of the men from Duffy's Cut fled west and ended up very near what is now Northwood Cemetery. We know that the Irish work crew that was working there at the time was under this Irish contractor, Peter Connor. And we started digging into the archives here in Chester County and found, um, I won't tell you the full deal, but let's just say there is a smoking gun in the midst of the county records here dealing with Peter Connor and, um, and, and another very, um, let's just say another powerful figure who lived in 1832 in the area around Downingtown. Um, I won't tell you the whole spiel because we're gonna we're gonna come out with that once once we discover the body. But there is there is a history of some violence at that Irish work site, and the fact of the matter is that that it's it seems like it could be very similar to what happened at Duffy's Cut. Um, the evidence is pointing in that direction. So if we find another set of you know whole. A set of railroad workers who have been murdered, it's not going to be as much of a surprise as it was. You should have seen our faces. We were digging at Duffy's Cut, and, and, and our anthropologists would call up and say, this one has a bullet in his skull. This one, this is a woman, and she was murdered. And it was like, you know, we, I wish we had a camera to, to film our faces, because we were like, what? Um, but Th This site, though, at Duffy's Cut, they buried him in a, in a very convenient spot, like Frank said, it became the later custom for the railroad to bury men in the field where they died. So put the put all the dirt that you know in lieu of a bridge would would become a kind of bridge. Like you know, this imagine there's a valley and then this is this is man-made. That didn't happen at Downingtown. It's all flat terrain. Um, you know, if you go if you follow the, the you know 113 up from Route 30 is where Northwood is. The families that owned the the track line in 1832 out here in Mile 48. Uh, the Philadelphia and Columbia, 
uh, we know their names because they all had to sign a contract saying that they were going to put up a fence to guard, you know, the uh, the rail line from their side. And those same families in uh, 1872, 1873 time frame, a number of decades later, decided that they were going to put a cemetery in a certain spot, which becomes Northwood, because they had a recollection, as, as was mentioned in enough sources, including Samuel Pennypacker's 1910 History of Downingtown, that when the work crew out here in mile 48 died, they were dragged up Route 113 on carts and buried as far away from the track line as possible because there was no place to hide them down there. You know, they didn't want to have them buried near the, the track line. So we've got reference in 1832 and then in 1910. And so you've got three years that mile 59 and mile 48 were connected. 1832, when cholera hit, people died. Other circumstances, you know, including violence. Um, 1872, that's when the stone monument, uh, the predecessor of the stone monument, the wooden fence went up at the cut. And then out here, they put a cemetery in. Because what are they going to do with the land? You can't till it if there's too many bones. They don't know where they are even. And then you come up to 1909, 1910. 1909, the stone monument takes the place of the wooden fence. And the file, the file is, is also in 1909 that the railroad starts. They create the very first part of the Pennsylvania Railroad file on Duffy's Cut. And, and, and the um, um, and out in um, Downingtown, Penny Packer's history comes out saying that this is a fact, that they know that there are... Yeah, these yeah. these two miles are connected. You got s Irish contractors on either end of that 11 miles, and you got Irish workers buried under them. Now there's a, a saying that there's a dead Irishman under every mile under every mile of track. It's probably a lot more than that <laughs> if you added them all up. Actually, if you were to look from <clears throat> the Erie Canal in New York to the New Orleans Canal in Louisiana, there's at least 10 to 15,000 Irishmen who died in the 1820s and 1830s, buried anonymously in mass graves. We'll never know their names. Um, you, know, you count them up, <clears throat> you come up with this fairly substantial number before the famine. That's a lot of people coming over here. And um, uh, the peculiar case of the cut is that we had a time frame when they arrived. We have the ship that's uh, passenger list happens to have survived. At Northwood, I don't think we're going get, to get, get that kind of closure, unfortunately. I mean, what we want to do there is excavate, have Janet Monge look at them, rebury them in Northwood, and get a Celtic cross there like there was at, at West Laurel Hill. Um, and the Irish community, I think, would back it. I mean, I think that we know the AOH is behind it and the cemetery itself, uh, Northwood. The cemetery board president is, is very much uh, behind us. So, uh, Bill, Bill Walton. Yep. He's a purveyor of his countrymen. He's a very effective purveyor of his countrymen. And, um, yeah, Catholic immigrant to get the highest paid contract along the entire, you know, 82-mile uh, line of the Philadelphia and Columbia speaks a lot to his abilities. But the fact that he left those guys out there buried at the cut speaks to his uh, something wrong in his psyche because he kept it secret, only became public knowledge at the year after he died. Now, this is a very <coughs> – I'm uh, Frank's – we were born Protestant, I became Catholic, and I'm uh, St. Francis in Springfield. But the thing is that I'm in the AOH, and the AOH was not behind this. All right. <clears throat> this was a tombstone for Philip Duffy. Uh, it was the brainchild of Russ Wiley uh, from the Friendly Sons, and now Friendly Sons and Daughters of St. Patrick. And um, the, the plan was to get a tombstone for Philip Duffy because guess what? His family knew that he w had such a bad reputation of leaving uh, people buried at the work sites that you don't give them a stone because it'll become an object of desecration. So <clears throat> the modern effort to get Philip Duffy a tombstone, we, we jumped on board with this because the parish deserves to be a part of the broader story of, of Philip Duffy's life. And the linking of that spot with Duffy's cut to us was important. So we helped uh, help get this stone. And Bill Doran, who Frank mentioned made the coffins, also um, got the tombstone made here. He'd almost been killed, my god, a few months earlier almost got crippled, um, came back from almost from the grave himself and saw this project through. And, um, you know, to us it was, uh, it, it was important to do. Not that the man was a good man. He was not a good man. Phil Duffy left people dying out there, you know. I mean, it, it didn't benefit him to have that story get out, obviously. It didn't benefit him that those men died. He didn't kill them. It was, it was the locals who killed them. But because you know, why would he have been behind that? It would have harmed his own ability to get other members of his uh, countrymen over here to work on other contracts, which he did until you know uh, 
his last contract with the Philadelphia Columbia was 1849, and thereafter working for the Reading Railroad. And um, we've we've heard from people whose uh, ancestors were brought over here by Duffy. Uh, there are also people who are brought over here as indentured. And yeah, he had people kicked out of his apartments that he owned up in Port Richmond because these Irishmen who he was exploiting couldn't pay their rent. He was not a good man, but getting the stone to us was important. Everybody deserves a tombstone, I think. Yeah, it's an interesting thing because Duffy is not a, he's not a hero of the story in any way, shape, or form. Um, he was aware of what was going on in his homeland um, with, the, with, the, um, with the famine, and when the corn laws were repealed, there was in Philadelphia a, a ball, a repeal ball, that was hosted by various Irish organizations. Um, and Duffy was one of the, one of the sponsors of the thing. He was, he's listed in, in the records as, as being involved in that. His sons, he had two sets of twins. That's how we helped to trace him genealogically. Um, two sets of twins, one was very clearly fraternal, a brother and a sister, and the other was almost certainly identical, even though there's no way to test it back in the 19th century. Um, and they, the two younger brothers, the twin brothers, were called the Battling Duffy Twins. Um, they were boxers. They were Irish musicians. Um, they were very much involved in the life of Port Richmond and the larger city of Philly, the Irish community. Um, and um, the fact that they lived with him, these, these, these bruisers, um, probably helps to uh, explain why the story didn't get out until after he died. Um, but these brothers um, were interesting characters. And uh, one of them lived in, a, in they, they both lived into the 20th century, but the reality is that the fact that they, um, they continued to live in the city of Philadelphia and participate in the Irish community says something about what he taught them about what it meant to be, um, you know, have, have some sort of pride in their Irish heritage. The problem was he was such an SOB with, with the folks he brought over, generally speaking. He did become a sponsor for some of his workers he became a sponsor for their citizenship. Um, one of them, Thomas Lappin, um, he was a sponsor for him. And, um, and the family remembers that to this very day, uh, Philip Duffy. But, um, but he's no way in any shape or form a hero. Nonetheless, we participated in this fully uh, because it's, it's, it's telling the story. You know, it's, it's, people would wonder, you know, where, where, people would ask us, where's Duffy buried? And we'd say, somewhere at St. Anne's. Now we can say he's buried here. And again, the priest, Father Skip, um, when I attended the last of the meetings for the historical commission before this, this dedication of this grave, he said that, that what my brother said was, was, was the truth, that the family was, was concerned that his grave would be desecrated, so they never put up a headstone. And, and look how long he lived, too. The average age of the workers at Duffy's Cut who died there was 22. And that, that was not you know, a, uh, a, a f historical fact that was lost on the dig crew who are about the same age, my students who are working out there with us. And um, this guy lived to be, like, you know, 80, 81 or something, 80, 88, 88 years old. You know, uh, how many others, you know, were left in the wake? You know, it's just ground under. Typical story of the Industrial Revolution, but unlike all the other stuff in the textbook, which are charts and diagrams, hopefully, you know, we're, we're trying to personalize, you know, this. And so we know the names and the, the lives of some of these people.